our team put together this presentation um, to really tell the story from a patient and a family's point of view. Um, Cheryl and Megan are extraordinary people. They're people with excellent coping skills, with strength, and I think excellent teachers for us as nurses and clinicians to really understand what's going on with chronically and seriously ill patients and their families. We know that a lot of nurses focus really on the science of nursing. We focus on the medications, we focus on the procedures, the surgeries, the severity of the, the patient's illness. But sometimes the human part of the story doesn't get told, or if it's told, we're so bus busy with the technical pieces, we don't really pay a lot of attention to it. So our goal was to really highlight not only the science of nursing, but also the art of nursing. And hopefully, we all can learn from this. We all can come away from this presentation a little bit changed, uh, a little bit more aware of some of the issues uh, that are so commonly encountered when we're working with seriously and chronically ill children and adolescents. And hopefully uh, we will improve our practice and be able to provide a higher quality of care for our patients. Somehow palliative care gets linked up with hospice. And we know that hospice is a wonderful system of care and it really focuses on the patient that has a limited life expectancy, six months or less. But palliative care has a little broader definition in that it does not have to be a life limiting disease or condition. So it opens the doors to many more patients who normally would not have access to um, this kind of care where the emphasis is on pain control, symptom management, quality of life. So not only on extending life, but also to live better. So not only adding life to years and years to life, but really looking at the quality of care and the quality of life in those years. We're really there to care for the patient to address as many of their needs as we can and really look beyond the medical models. When you're dealing with an adult or an older adult and you're making critical health care decisions about their treatments and the progression of their disease, you're really focused on the here and now and what's going to work for this patient today and what's going to improve the quality of their life. But with a child, of course, you're always thinking about not only the here and now, but what's going to be happening 30, 40, 50 years even into the future. It calls for, I think, a, a different level of critical thinking by the nurse, uh, a different level of knowledge. Uh, we all do risk, benefits and risk benefit analyses when we're advising patients and their families, but perhaps these analyses are more complicated when you're dealing with children and issues around treatment of children. Huntington's disease is a progressive brain disorder, and it's a genetic disorder. In terms of the symptoms, there are three main aspects to the disease. The first is movement symptoms or motor symptoms, and the hallmark is chorea, which are extra flowing type of movements uh, that are involuntary. People can also have dystonia, which is extra muscle contraction and, and excessive posturing and can be painful as well, but that's only one part of the puzzle. You People can also have behavioral problems where they have impulsiveness or poor attention and cognitive issues as well where they can have memory troubles or executive functioning where simple or complex tasks become more difficult to do. It's a genetic disorder which means that it's inherited from a mother or father and if you have a parent with it you have a 50 percent chance of inheriting the disease. If you get the gene you're going to get the disease that, that's pretty clear and it's a progressive process People usually start with symptoms in their mid-30s, but it, age ranges from anywhere from two up into the 90s and everywhere in between. Kids can get it when they have a larger number of copies of the gene. So it's, it's really not just a yes-no test in terms of the testing, it's the number of copies of the gene. 
And if they have a large, exp large gene expansion or a large number of copies of the gene, they can get the disease earlier uh, in life. It's a little different because it's generally people get what's called the Westfall variant, which is not so much the chorea and, and excessive movements, but much more slowness and dystonia. And if they don't have that initially, they develop it fairly rapidly. Um, and with more dystonia and slowness, people tend to have more falls, more swallowing troubles, and tend not to do as well longer term. Therefore, the, the lifespan isn't as long. After John and I got married, and I was practicing as a nurse, I only ever saw one patient that had Huntington's disease, and she was in the later stages. So I wasn't even really sure what I should be looking for. But before John and I decided to have children, I said to him, you know what, let's just check with your family doctor. I said, you know, after having seen this patient, you know, on my floor, I, I just want to find out. We asked the family doctor. He told us very emphatically, no, John, your mother definitely did not have Huntington's disease. So we felt it was safe to, you know, go ahead and start our family. Fast forward 11 years. Now it's the summer of 1989. Megan was two, and my older daughter, Caitlin, was eight at the time. And we were on a family vacation to Niagara Falls. John was driving. And I noticed as we were driving that I saw really subtle signs, but his shoulders were like shrugging, and he had a little bit of tapping with his fingers. And I had never noticed him do that before. And I just thought, oh, you know, I'm sure I'm imagining it, or he's tired, or whatever. But this was in July of 1989. Um, from July to December, over the course of the four or five months, I slowly noticed that, um, you know, the shrugging was increasing, the figure flicking was increasing, um, a little bit of facial grimacing. But again, I just kept thinking, you know, am I imagining this? Is this part of Huntington's disease? You know, I don't really know. So John had a neuropsychological um, exam and, you know, extensive neurological testing. And the neurologist at the time decided that he felt John had been smarter than he currently was. And even though Overall, the neuro exam was pretty much normal. Um, there was a little bit, you know, off. So when I brought up the possibility of the family history of Huntington's disease, the neurologist said, well, that, you know, would explain it. The scariest, um, you know, issue upon learning John's diagnosis was knowing that now Caitlin and Megan each had a 50-50 chance of inheriting this disease. And not once did John ever question, why me? You know, he never cried for himself. He only ever thought about his daughters. I recall first seeing Megan when she was a little five-year-old, um, bubbly, outgoing little girl and had a hard time sitting still so we would take walks to a local pond and feed the geese. We would bring bread and, and chat and talk about life, um, nothing too serious, although there was an awareness on her part that not only was her dad ill but that there was a chance someday that she could develop the illness. Um, she was very, reassured, very much reassured by her parents that they were doing everything in their power to search for a cure and that hopefully by the time she was old enough to um, possibly become symptomatic, um, that it wouldn't be an issue for her. Hi, everyone. I have a big today. I am 23. When I was a sophomore at fifth year college in Nashville, I found out I had a juvenile Huntington's disease. 
I was almost 20. And yeah, but hard in the beginning after my diagnosis. I was really angry. Other students were coming up to her and saying, oh my God, Megan, I can't believe, you know, it's 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and you're already drunk. Um, I really hope I can. She said it really hurt her feelings. Yeah, people acted to me. But it was also scary for her because she knew what that meant, that she knew that she definitely had inherited, you know, the HD gene. When she came home for Christmas, um, at Christmas 2006, one night we were sitting on the couch watching TV and Megan was very fidgety. I freaked out at my mom. And I said, you know, Megan, can you please just sit still? And as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I was like, oh my gosh. Because really, since the summer of 2006, myself, um, Kevin, Caitlin, we were slowly seeing the signs of Huntington's. And so that night when I said that to Megan, she ran upstairs, locked herself in the room, and I ran up after her and through the door she yelled, Mom, are you trying to tell me that I have Huntington's? And I said, what do you think? Because I wanted her to say it herself first, only because as a parent it was really hard, and I kept thinking, how am I going to tell her this? And she just didn't answer, but I knew by the fact that she asked this question that she certainly was thinking about it. As I was awesome. I remember before I got diagnosed, it was a month before she got diagnosed. I came home for a day with my boyfriend, and I told my mom, I said, oh, mom, <coughs> I felt I put her lemonade and got a gay glass. I said, mom, I think I have each day. And it was really strange because just like a day or two before this happened, I was on the phone with Caitlin and I said, you know, we have to get Megan into Mass General. And I said, but it's just so frightening for me to have to sit down and tell her this. And, you know, as a parent, you want to protect your child. And I couldn't protect her, you know, from this. When Megan was going through the process of being tested, she was accompanied by an entourage of supporters, including her mom, her stepfather, Kevin, her sister, Caitlin, her sister's husband, her best friend from childhood, and me. Um, we all went together as a large group. We sat in the waiting room for lengthy periods of time, telling jokes and playing cards and keeping each other supported. And then in the process itself, in the, in the room itself, when she was talking to the neurologist and the social worker, Cheryl and I alone would, would, would go in. But the, the, on, the rest of the entourage would be waiting in the waiting room to greet her when she came out. And that's how we supported Megan through the process, because it is a, an extremely stressful, difficult, emotionally laden, powerful process to go through. Although I w am a traditionally psychoanalytically trained therapist, it never seemed like the right type of therapy for someone like Megan. And in fact, it felt very natural for me to develop a very real relationship with her. Um, that's um, a style that I've developed on my own from having worked with adolescents and young children, and it was a good fit for Megan and her family. It was pretty clear at the outset that that was the way the treatment was going to go, that there was an entire team of people working together to make this little girl's life as she grew um, as positive as possible, given that the outcome was uncertain. I've been Megan's neurologist for about four years, and it's been an unbelievable pleasure working with her. She's really been an inspiration for me. Um, and, and I think it's because she's so positive. She's so energetic. She's always looking to ask another question, which her family was very apologetic about. But to me, I saw it as someone who's continued to take interest in her own health and, and what's going on in, in her own life. And um, she, I think she really liked that time alone with me. She would kick everybody else out of the room and 
and just ask me questions. And, and usually it was the same questions that, that she'd always asked. But um, I, I've, in terms of my focus for treating Megan, it's really been symptomatic. And that's true for everyone with Huntington's disease. It's a progressive disorder. It's invariably uh, fatal. And so really everything that we do from the first moment, I think of as palliative care. Uh, because we're alleviating the symptoms, we're trying to improve their quality of life, we're trying to reduce pain and keep function up as long as possible. As you can see, her career and her movements you know, um, are very pronounced. <coughs> Megan takes a lot of um, medications. Megan takes 30 grams of creatine and um, 2,400 milligrams of coenzyme Q10. In mice models, these are the only two drugs that, or supplements, I should say, that have been shown to um, keep the brain cell energy up and to kind of um, decrease the rate of the cell death in the brain. She wakes up pretty early, well, somewhere between six and seven, and um, she likes to take care of our dog, so mm -hmm. she'll put the dog yeah, out. Yeah, puppy. Yeah, um, yeah a schnoodle puppy. Yeah. A schnoodle puppy. His name is Seamus, yeah. Uh -huh. I cook Megan a pretty big breakfast because um, for That's people with hunting, yeah, for people with Huntington's disease, because of all the movements, it's almost like running a marathon every day. Um, so they recommend that you have 6,000 calories a day. Uh, so it, it <laughs> sounds fun, but it is really hard trying to um, make sure she eats that. So like I said, so we'll have a you know big breakfast, yeah. and then I give Megan you know her shower. <laughs> Yeah. And I have a home health aide. She comes here lunch and I say, Tali, uh, you don't better cook than I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get jealous. <laughs> um, you know, I have to help Megan, you know, brush her teeth, help her, you know, get dressed. Um, then depending. I tell my mom, I say, son, that's, it's so frustrating. I can't. Hardly do anything for Megan's relationship with Cheryl is very interesting because it seems to have a parallel path. On the one hand, developmentally, Cheryl has needed to be Megan's caretaker, obviously, and Megan so appreciates her mom taking care of her and so appreciates the fact that she doesn't have to worry and really feels empathy for her mother's situation. On the other hand, Megan has gone on this very normal developmental path of wanting to be independent from her mother. Before she became symptomatic, she was very insistent on having more and more independence and would be actually quite annoyed when her mother would be checking in on her. Um, and you have to understand that there was this vulnerability in Megan, which I think really required Cheryl to check in on her more than the average high school and um, early college student. And Megan resented that. And they would have struggles around that. And those struggles still exist today. So there will be battles between them where Megan will be somewhat resentful of her mother and push up against her. But that actually is quite delightful because Megan is really expressing herself in a, development, a developmentally appropriate way. And it is a wonderful thing to see. At the same time, she's on this journey towards requiring her mother's care and help more and more and more and appreciates that. So there's a dichotomy between Megan absolutely adoring her mother and appreciating everything she's doing and being a typical, I would say, late adolescent um, and wanting to do things on her own and feeling like her mother is not patient enough with her or not appreciative enough of her or not giving her enough attention. Um, and that's, that's, that's a kind of tension that exists in their relationship, which I think is what it is and, and needs to continue to exist. Since last summer, Megan and I have talked frequently that probably 
within some time this year, she will have to go to a nursing facility um, herself. It started becoming more physically unsafe for Megan to be at home. Um, we have three stories and um, all the bedrooms are upstairs. The full baths are also upstairs. So um, yeah. at least once a day, Megan probably has a fall very often coming or going up or down the stairs um, in part sometimes because she's not always paying attention but uh, you know other times just through no fault of her own um, sometimes as you can see it's very difficult for her to even just sit in a chair sit on the couch you know people say to me oh my god you're such a saint you know you took care of your husband for all these years now you're taking care of Megan and someday you're going to have to take care of Caitlin. Believe me, there are plenty of days that I'm angry at God and why did this, you know, have to happen. But I always like to tell everybody, in the 22 years now that we've been dealing with Huntington's disease, it is the suckiest, pardon my language, disease that I know of, but I have been so blessed. So we have met so, so many wonderful people yeah, that that we would not otherwise have met. I get my mom to love me. Escape from my mom. Yeah, as we know a parent should not love their child. And, but every day I pray to God, please keep me in good health. And I need to live to like a hundred so that I can <laughs> take care of everybody. When I look at Megan and think, you know, this is absolutely not fair that at 19, you know, to have gotten diagnosed <laughs> with this, that I just feel that I owe Megan everything that I possibly can to give her as good of a quality Thank of you. life. Thank you. You're welcome, honey. I love you. Thank you. Um, I say so. I'm blessed at my mom. Thank you, honey. I love her. Thank you, honey. You're welcome. I love you. The hardest aspect of treating Megan has been evolving and changing my treatment as we go along according to how she has been changing. Um, it's been a little bit difficult, particularly as she's become less and less able to communicate effectively with me. Uh, it's been very tough to figure out a way to make those the sessions meaningful for her and that's been hard on me. It's also been incredibly hard for me to see her deteriorate over the years. I, I can honestly say I love Megan. I feel like I absolutely need to be part of her life, and I feel like I very much am part of her life. I truly love Megan. We have developed that kind of a relationship, and it's been extraordinarily important for me to have that kind of very personal connection with her. One of the hardest things for me in terms of Megan, Huntington's is a progressive disease, and it's fatal, and she knows that. But every step along the way, when she has lost some type of function or something else has happened, it's been very, it's, it's been emotionally very hard for me to watch that and to know that there's nothing I can do about it. And every time I, I had a visit with her where there was something else lost or she needed more care or there was something else that happened, it actually drove me more to want to do something whether it's clinically or research, but it, to, it's, that's probably been the hardest thing to watch is when I can't do something for her and watching it decline, even though I knew long before it happened that it was going to happen. It's amazing how many lives Megan has touched and changed. I've seen medical students that have been with me during Huntington's Disease Clinic cry because they are so overwhelmed with Megan and everything, her energy, her enthusiasm, everything that she has brought to this, the fact that she has stayed so positive despite the fact that she's in a, she's in a nursing home now. And if you go and talk with her, she is still overall a very positive person. 
And so to go through such trials and to still be strong through it. So Megan, I think probably more than any other patient since I've, I've been a physician now for 14 years, I, I, I don't think that I've been touched by any other patient as much as her. As a therapist and as a human being, there's no way to come away from such an experience working with such an extraordinary young woman as Megan unchanged. Um, it's been a bittersweet journey working with her. On the one hand, observing her extraordinary courage under the circumstances that she's been dealt has been inspiring, and I have been honored to help her through that. On the other hand, the sadness that I feel for her short life is profound. Uh, last week, I was visiting her in her nursing home, and I was pushing her in her wheelchair. When I arrived to visit her, what she wanted to do was to, for me to push her in her wheelchair to the unit that her father had lived and died on so that she could visit her father's old roommate who's still alive. So I was pushing Megan in her chair and just feeling the sadness of her not being independently mobile anymore. Watching her greet each patient and try to lighten each patient's day, going from bed to bed, having a kind word for everyone, and then ending up in her father's room. I had tears streaming down my face. And in some ways, I was kind of glad that she couldn't see me, that she was in front of me in the wheelchair. It's not that I didn't want to share my emotion, but I really didn't want to take away the meaning for, of what she was doing um, by having my emotion interfere. But don't get me wrong, it's been an incredible, experience for me as a, as a person as well as a therapist. I feel that the palliative care helped me take care of John and Megan you know, um, for as long as I can, could, and to really enhance the quality um, of life. In July and August of 08, that's when he really, he had three consecutive um, aspiration pneumonias. And it was after the third one that I knew, okay, it's just, I'm um, only going to, you know, have care and comfort measures. And the staff at Tewksbury was great. Um, they always had um, a nurse, be it an LPN or an RN, in the room with John, you know, at all times, um, you know, 24 hours a day. And that was really comforting to me because for the, for the four weeks prior to his death, I did try to be there as much as I could, but I also needed to be at home, you know, for Megan. Um, not, she didn't need as much help then as she does now, but... Um, so I was very grateful for the palliative care oh. slash hospice care, if you will, at that uh. point that um, I knew, God forbid, should John die, oh. he would never, you know, be alone. And so I definitely, you know, think the role of palliative care has been very important, both at end of life and just maintaining, you know, the best quality of life. I just know that this is the kind of treatment that made sense for Megan, that she needed to be surrounded by people from all aspects of her life to make things work for her. And that's the only way that I was able to really feel like I was a helpful therapist to her. I know that it was incredibly important and it still continues to be really important to work that way. And I feel like it ultimately it turned out to be very instinctive for me to have people around in different areas of expertise so that we could all come together and help Megan the best we could. Best piece of advice that I could give someone that wanted to enter, you know, palliative care mm -hmm. is that first and foremost you need to be compassionate um, and understanding. It's okay if you don't know every, you know, anatomical or physiological um, information about the disease, 
what you need to do is to be there for the patient and for the family. They don't, I know, I wouldn't care if you didn't know every little thing about Huntington's disease. What I want to know is that you're there for me and that you will carry out, you know, the wishes of myself or, you know, my loved ones. Um, and you also would have to enter into it that working, you know, with families, their wishes and desires may be totally opposite of, you know, what you would want if you were in that situation, but that you have to, you know, just put that out of your mind. You have to just go according, you know, to the wishes of the family. Um, but again, caring and compassion and just knowing, okay, I'm there to hold your hand. I'm there, you know, for whatever you need. That, to me, would be the most important part of entering, you know, into the palliative care nursing profession. <laughs>